So uh, today we're talking about Evolve. It is a first-person shooter that is available on um, Xbox One, PS4, and PC. And basically, uh, I'm going to tell you about our adventure in accessibility retrofitting. A common theme that's been brought up is you should always think about accessibility from the beginning. And Evolve is a story about what happens when you don't. Uh, so, uh, just quick about me, I've worked on stuff. Uh, no, so I've been in game development for uh, nine years uh, with quality assurance and user research uh, background before going into production. Um, I'm now a project manager for Gaikai, it's a part of Sony, we do like the remote play in the PlayStation Now app. Um, but the important part of this is that I worked at Total Rock and I was the uh, live ops communications producer while I was there and that's how we start our story. So in this presentation, um, I'm going to talk about how we evaluated our accessibility, uh, what we did to make our game more accessible, um, what did we learn in the, this process, and then how you can take what we learned to do it better than we did. So the first question is obviously, how well did we do? Now, before you can answer how well did you do, you have to have something to grade yourself against. Now, Although there were plenty of guidelines on how to develop games accessibly, there wasn't something read avail readily available to kind of score yourself with um, for an existing game. So our first step on our accessibility retrofitting adventure was to actually create our own report card um, based off a bunch of different guidelines. So we looked at gameaccessibilityguidelines.com, includification by the Able Gamers, uh, the special effect wish list, and then the IGA game accessibility SIG uh, guidelines. And so we combed through each uh, individual feature that these guidelines mentioned and took out duplicates and then and in the end we had a list of about 115 different accessibility features to check against. Uh, so we then started assigning values to each of these features. So we evaluated them for the reach, the number of people they would benefit, uh, the impact, so the difference they would make to those people, and the cost, uh, and we did this for the amount of time uh, our development effort needed to complete that task if we had done it the first time. Not the cost of retrofitting, just how much would this have cost to do it from the beginning. And this was actually really easy to do because most of the guidelines we were looking at kind of already had this tiered structure. And so based on this information, we placed each feature into a tier and assigned it a point value. So something basic would be like simple subtitles, just that act of them being there. So that's three points. Like That's pretty easy and you should do it. Um, but something major would require a lot of work with something along the lines of you know, being able to move and resize all the UI elements. So we went through item by item and then we awarded uh, full points for fully met goals, partial points for partial implementation or sometimes subpar implementation implementation, um, zero points for just not having anything that was like that, or uh, marked it not applicable if it didn't apply to us. So if there was like a guideline related to voice activation and our game didn't have it, you know, we're going to knock ourselves for that. So what was our overall score? Uh, we got like a 64%. Uh, you know, we did some things right and we did a lot of things wrong. So obviously we had room for improvement with our near failing grade. Um, so we began combing through this report card that we made to see where to start. Um, we really wanted to look through the basic features first and see what basic features we may have missed. And that was something, like I said, because they were supposed to be these easier ones to implement, we should be able to do right away. And we also started uh, going through all of our player feedback, particularly uh, our forums, to see areas that players were already telling us that they were having problems. Um, so we identified our starting list of features and we began scoping out the work. So what was the first thing we did? Um, one of the most requested features for uh, anything about game accessibility was amazingly simple with next to no cost. Um, gamers with disabilities often don't know if they can play a game until they buy it because they don't have any information on what game accessibility features are present in that title. Um, so we went and we decided we wanted to put something out there. So we got uh, this icon, uh, which is an icon denoted for game accessibility information that was put out by OneSwitch and we got permission to use it. 
and we made a simple online post. Uh, it was just a factual list. We state what features we had, um, the options associated with those features, and we were honest about things that our title didn't have. Um, we decided really on, early on that we would rather be open about our game's features, whether it had or did not have it, um, and hope to be better in the future, and maybe even deter someone from buying our game, rather than have them buy it only to find out that they can't play. Um, we had a conversation with uh, our co-founders, and our co-founder Phil put it, uh, we shouldn't do that, that would just be shitty. So, you know, we, we were just honest, like, we want people to know if we can, they can play. So, based on the feedback from gamers, one of the first things we prioritized was colorblind mode. Uh, we quickly realized that we had a lot of UI elements that were only using color to identify the state. So, one example was our ping system. So, it had red or green circles, you know, based on what you were working. Uh, and the fix was this was actually really simple, and we actually were able to make them more useful. So what used to be red and green circles, you can see like, this is now an icon for monster. This is now a caution symbol for a plant that will eat you. This is just a wildlife who's there. Before, all of these were just the circles, so if you were colorblind, you wouldn't be able to tell. Uh, another example of something we found out was a problem was uh, actually our character names. So if you wanted to know what class someone was, you just looked at the color of their name. Obviously, if you're colorblind, you don't know if that person is a support or a medic. So we actually decided to update that to include icons above their name. Now, in the original implementation, when you turned on colorblind mode, these icons would just show above the uh, player's name so you knew what they were. But uh, we actually had way larger problems than our UI. So this screenshot's a little blurry, but I kept it anyway because I think it's a really good rep representation of one of our problems. Uh, once we got beyond our in-game UI elements, we hit this huge hurdle. We had several in-game visual effects that uh, either had a state based on color, and that was compounded by the fact that sometimes the visual effects were just getting lost. So this is an example of you know a red icon that's getting lost in a green swamp. If you're colorblind, you just can't see this. So we knew early on that adding a colorblind filter wasn't the way to go about this. Uh, you know, we weren't having problems with all of our visual effects, just certain elements, not the entire game. So if we added a colorblind filter, it could adjust one color, but it would then change a bunch of other colors, and not only would it look absolutely terrible, it could have just made things that weren't a problem, a new problem. So we needed to do something, but we weren't sure what. So for these in-game features, we ended up making three additional versions of each in-game visual effect uh, that the player would select before loading into the level. So that's right, for features we found that were causing issues in colorblind mode, we ended up with four versions of that effect. Uh, the one that we shipped with, and then one for the three most color, uh, common types of colorblindness. So obviously the cost of, of retrofitting colorblind uh, accessibility into our title was huge. It literally quadrupled the work because we didn't think about it originally. But we were really good about thinking about it going forward. So our goal was not to introduce new uh, features because we were still uh, launching new hunters, new mon monsters, that sort of thing. We didn't want to launch anything else that we would have to add into colorblind mode. So how did we do this? Well, we got smart. Um, we started looking at stuff in the concept phase before we even made the visual effects. So if we saw a gun had two different states, but the concept are looked like the picture on the left, no, that's not gonna fly. We would just send it back to concept art. Um, and over time, we got better at making sure there was a visual difference other than color. We could still use color, but we wanted something else. So if it looked like something on the right, yay, that's good. Uh, we would go ahead and start working on it. So in the end, we did make several additional updates to colorblind mode beyond the initial, initial patch. Uh, we caught even more UI elements, such as uh, outlines, um, and then actually the class icon fix I mentioned earlier, that feature was so we had non-colorblind gamers turning on colorblind mode because they liked the icons. So what we ended up doing there was pulling that out of colorblind mode and making it its own feature. 
So, you know, I think we've all been saying this, but that goes to show, you know, accessibility features will be used beyond uh, this small accessibility group and it will make a better experience for your core gamers as well. So, uh, the next one we went for was remappable controls. So, although we had remappable keyboard controls, we didn't have anything for controller, which meant that uh, our players in the Xbox One and PS4 couldn't remap at all. And this was obviously highly requested, and it was incredibly helpful for gamers with lots of different impairments. So what was interesting about when we went to do this feature is we found out that at one time, uh, in the game's earlier development, someone had actually started to implement this feature, but um, it ended up getting cut. Basically, someone had tried to just duplicate the PC system over on console. It was, led to a really poor user experience, so it was pretty buggy. And so they weren't really sure what to do with it, so they just kind of scratched, you know, scrapped it. It wasn't worth the effort. Um, so once we decided it was something to, we wanted to do, uh, we honestly uh, just took, I did a previous GDC talk called uh, No More Excuses Your Guide to Accessibility Design, and we just like straight ripped out the design I talked about. So we wanted to offer multiple control schemes, uh, making sure that the actions were kind of paired different. So you can see uh, action and reload are here, but actions paired with use cover over here. And then once the player selected the uh, control scheme that they wanted, they could just fully swap those buttons and all the actions would go with it. So for us in terms of getting this feature in, uh, we had very few issues getting it in and tested, but this was only because a lot of the pitfalls of remapable controls were avoided because we already had remapping on PC. Uh, you know, stuff like making sure we had all the UI elements, like we had already done that, making sure that the UI could dynamically update. That was all work that we had already done. So obviously for other games, you know, retrofitting, the cost may be significantly higher, especially if you are, um, you know, not cross-platform like we were. Uh, but like I said, we had kind of already started and we had most of the guts in there already, so it was pretty quick for us. Uh, so this was something that we were actually really excited about. So remapable controls in colorblind mode were the first features that made it to the public uh, from our accessibility launches. And we decided that we wanted to let people know they're there. If people don't know you have accessibility features, gamers who use them aren't going to go looking for them, they're not going to play your title anyway. So we took the time to educate our audience on the idea of game accessibility and why it was important not only to us as developers, but to us as gamers. Uh, and we went ahead and told players where to provide additional feedback and requests, opening the door to future accessibility conversations with our players. Um, so we had a, a weekly live stream with Evolve on its Switch channel that had uh, 23,000 followers, and we dedicated a half hour of this live stream just talking about uh, accessibility and why it was important and our new features. And it was also hosted by the Turtle Rock channel, so uh, that was really exciting. And then I got to be on it, and my hair looked really good that day. <laughs> uh, but we knew that there was a lot more that we could do. And around this time, we learned that we were basically going to get to relaunch um, as a ball stage to our free-to-play model. And we knew ba basically we could go crazy at this point. So we decided, yeah, let's go nuts. Uh, so one of the first things we did um, was this massive visual effects overhaul. So we had a lot of things happening in our game. So there were four hunters, there was a monster, there were things they could do like area attacks, we had wildlife, and you could have all of this stuff with its own visual effect happening at the same time. And it made it difficult not only for players with visual impairments to see what was happening, but just legitimately our core player base. Like if you look at the picture on the left, like, good luck. You can't see what's happening. So we had this idea of um, updating, and we ended up updating about 50% of our visual effects with a goal of clarity, less noise, and defined borders. So the changes were completely drastic. So if you look at this screenshot, you can see the before and after of the uh, Kraken Aftershock. So before, it's just this kind of fuzzy thing that's happening, but on the right, 
Uh, it's more high contrast, it has a very defined edge, and it actually relieved a major problem that we've been having with gameplay anyway. So only players who played against Kraken all the time knew where to dodge to not get hit by this particular ability. If you were new or just didn't play against Kraken a whole bunch, you just guessed. You had no idea how far you had to dodge to get out of it. So when we went and updated this and made everything more clear and defined, now even new players just, they're like, oh, here, here is the line that I need to get out of to not get smashed. Uh, so we found that that was a really good benefit after we changed it. Uh, and another thing that we went absolutely ham on was actually our tutorials. So we had originally some tutorials in, and they were a good space for you to learn the controls, but not much more. It didn't really teach you about core game mechanics, and being able to complete the tutorial wasn't a one-to-one -one translation of actually being able to play the game. So if you were using the tutorial to adjust to gameplay, it wasn't going to happen. They were too different. So we went through and we created uh, the advanced tutorials where we basically had one tutorial for each class with the best starter character for that class. And it allowed to get everyone like a better grasp of the basics before moving on. Um, it was a really good space for a player to take their time and get adjusted to the class and actually learn the controls and how to play that class before actually going into game. Now this was actually one of the most complex features that we ended up retrofitting in. Uh, but it was a great experience uh, for us as devs. So not only did we have to make sh sure we understood what game we had built and how to play, we had to know how to teach it to other people. Uh, we ended up developing an entire new queuing system just to make sure that the most important core server, um, the VO of Abe and Kyra, who were your tutorial guides, uh, was heard above all of the other noises and got priority in the subtitles so they wouldn't get stomped on by uh, less important systemic dialogue like reloading, monster, et cetera, et cetera. So this was a huge undertaking, but it was really great in that uh, we had a terrible learning curve to begin with, and if you were actually trying to know if you could play the game or adjust to the controls, you couldn't really do it previously. Uh, we also went nuts on updating uh, our UI. So we found a ton, like a literal ton, of in-game occurrences that were either sound-based, um, sometimes so subtle that players, even without hearing impairments, uh, had no idea they existed, or the UI associated with the stuff was so subtle or uh, low contrast that people didn't even know that we had icons for things. So we really wanted to double down on communicating information on more than one way. So we ended up adding a bunch of different stuff. So this has is an example of like, um, this is like the defense matrix. And before, if someone had this, it'd be like a little tiny bar around their health bar. And no one could really tell, is that a shield? Is it this thing? Is it that thing? No one knew, so we could put these giant things on people. No one's obvious what that's happening to that guy. Uh, we also ended up adding, like, if you had one, all this, like, stuff would bubble up around the side of the screen. So it was clear to you if you also had one of these. Um, and we did similar stuff for poisoning, healing, shield damage, fire damage, you know, a ton, a ton of stuff that players were just getting lost. Um, and beyond this, we took steps to make uh, other things in the environment more contrast. So we had visual tells, such like as a dead carcass, a monster could kill uh, a wildlife and eat it, and that was a sign that you could use to track the monster. But they would just get lost in the environment because they weren't contrast. So we put outlines on them, and we made them bright, so they were a lot easier to see. Uh, we also added giant visual effects to elite wildlife. Um, we added new UI elements. Uh, for major events like the dome dropping or if a teammate went down. And obviously you can't add UI elements for everything. Uh, that would be crazy. So we also put in a in-game announcer who was uh, also captured in our subtitles uh, to capture other stuff that we just didn't want to add more um, UI elements for. So we added an additional audio tell in addition to what was already there. Uh, you know, here's just another example of just like, you know, we just kept adding more and more ways to give you information. Okay, uh, we also just uh, decided to change our gameplay drastically. 
So uh, to be frank, Evolve had a difficulty problem. We found that our gameplay was majorly inaccessible and it only took a single player underperforming, as it were, uh, on a team to completely ruin the experience for everyone um, and it was creating a massively toxic, get good type of community, which wasn't what we wanted. So we started making gameplay adjustments to more evenly distribute uh, gameplay tasks. So it made the game easier to play and to understand. It also meant if there was one player who was struggling with a particular class they were assigned to, uh, the team could work together to balance it out so that they could still have a chance at winning. Uh, we wanted to create gameplay that was inclusive where the whole team could work together and they would be encouraged to uh, teach or help train or pick up slack rather than just punish and berate players who they felt were not up to par. And we ended up changing a lot. Uh, I mean, this is just like really quick example, like these are all three new class abilities we added. This is one of our monsters, Behemoth. He got a complete rework, um, including his visual effects. We basically rebuilt all of his code to change him to make him better. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, gamers with disabilities frequently don't know if they can play a game until after they buy it and they try it out. So even after Evolve Stage 2 launched, sure they could try the game for free, but we still had some element of that problem. So now you could spend either your in-game currency or your real-world money to buy a character that you didn't have unlocked which could pose the exact same problem a gamer may not know that they either don't like or can't play a character until they buy them. So we decided to implement this try before you buy system. Uh, so even a, a new monster when they come out, like there's literally just a try button. You could go into single player and you could play every character and use any perk of any, uh, we had tiers like one, two, three, uh, of any tier that you wanted before you spent your money. So you could try it before you buy it, because again, we wanted, we didn't want people to spend their money to get something and then find out that they couldn't actually use it. And obviously, you know, going into single player isn't quite the same, especially with our multiplayer game. So the other thing we ended up implementing was a hunter rotation. So each week we had one hunter from each class and a monster free for you to take uh, online without buying them. So we couldn't put everyone for free all the time in multiplayer, but if you waited long enough, you know, eventually that other character you're interested in would come around and you could try them for free online. Uh, so another thing we did uh, was we did a stream for Global Accessibility Awareness Day. Uh, basically, we saw the Uncharted 4 video come out in the morning with all of the accessibility stuff they did and it pitched a fit that we hadn't done something just as cool. Uh, so we decided that we were going to do a stream. And it was very last minute. Uh, it was literally, we didn't even go to the live stream area. We did it from my desk with a whiteboard behind me to like block out the rest of the studio. Um, but we got to talk about a lot of stuff. So on the stream, uh, we talked about the changes that were due to be released. So a lot of them were the things I talked about previously. And we were able to highlight that, yeah, we, we still care about accessibility. Like since that last stream we did, like we haven't forgotten. You know, we're, we're still working to make things more accessible. And again, a lot of the changes we were making, like we had like our core players turning into a live stream about accessibility because they were just interested in a lot of these features anyway. Um, and the stream was also a great opportunity for us. So our low budget whiteboard from my desk stream got picked up in a few blogs that were kind of rounding up uh, news for that day. And so we got exposure through accessibility that we wouldn't have gotten otherwise. Um, and we also announced two other features that uh, didn't have a cemented ship date, but were in the works. And one of them was uh, closed captions. Now this feature we actually started developing um, at the same time as remappable controls in colorblind mode, uh, but we didn't uh, get it uh, uh, completed in time to ship with that initial patch. So uh, hooking up the initial system to get the option of subtitles versus closed captions and all that stuff in, we got that in pretty fast, we didn't have a problem with that, um, but we did hit a major stumbling block, which is why I didn't make it into that first accessibility patch. Uh, the big question was, what sounds should be triggering a cue? Which were gameplay important sounds we needed to capture? And 
That may sound like a really simple question, but as we kind of dug into Involve, we realized that that absolutely was not true. Um, so uh, working with the engineer who built the system, uh, we kind of took a stab at making a first draft list of what we thought should be captured, and I brought it over to our balance group. Um, they're uh, in QA, but they're comprised of um, former competitive players of Evolve who we actually hired to help make sure that you know, the game wasn't being broken at like those super high tier player levels when we were updating it. And I, I brought this in because I obviously know uh, every sound cue. And like, here, here's a recap of how me bringing this list went. Hey guys, look, I made this list. It's really awesome. All the sounds are on it, right? Uh, Terry, you left spotters off the list. I have no idea what you're talking about. Oh yeah, spotters make a noise when they see the monster. I had no idea that sound was in game. <laughs> so I will admit, uh, I don't have the best hearing, but there were there was not just one, but several sounds. I I either one didn't know were in game period, or two meant something. I just didn't know. Um, so we, like I said, that was when we really started digging in, trying to figure out what to do. But around that time, that's when we also started making all those massive UI changes and gameplay changes. So we kind of put this on the back burner till that was finished being reworked. Um, and unfortunately, uh, Evolve's contract, or, or Turtle Rock's contract for Evolve ended before we got the final product done. So it didn't ship, but uh, it was close. Uh, another thing that we started working on that also didn't ship was the comm wheel. Um, I didn't get a chance to grab any in-game footage, so this is actually some of the concept art, it ended up being uh, pretty close to this in the end. But one of the things that had become very apparent with Evolve was if you either weren't using a mic or couldn't use a mic, our game was nearly impossible to play. Communication was key uh, in multiplayer. So sure, on PC you had in-game text, but that wasn't always fast enough, especially in like high profile situations where like the monster is there and you need to get shit done right now and that wasn't available on console at all. So we started developing the common wheel. Um, we ended up having more than these four options here, but we basically identified like, what are the things that you need to say and you need to say it quickly and you need to say frequently. So we basically put those options on a wheel um, and you could trigger it and it would place an icon, uh, as you can see on the right, like in the world, if it was like something like group up here kind of deal, uh, or it would uh, pop up an icon if it were like, help me if you were down or something like that. Um, honestly, the largest problem that we encountered was how to have a nice system that worked, that play, that was easy to use on both the controller and the PC. Um, we had built it to kind of work nicely on the controller and when we went to stick it on the PC, like it was awkward, but it really wasn't. Uh, fast to use, which kind of defeated the point of having a comm wheel. So we were tinkering with it to make it better, but again, um, the contract ended up ending for Evolve, so that was uh, something that didn't ship. Uh, so really, what should you learn from our adventure and accessibility retrofitting? Uh, so some of the things we implemented weren't that much work to do after the fact, um, and some things that should have been really simple, like colorblind mode, ended up being huge. Uh, none of this stuff would have been that hard if we had just thought about it from the beginning or if someone had even maybe just mentioned it. Um, and I know this, like, this doesn't sound like an actual lesson, but apparently it is worth repeating. Uh, Pre-production is the time to start thinking about accessibility. Uh, the next one is really, you know your game, you know how your game works, uh, but you need to know how players know your game and how players are going to engage your game. So you need to have playtests with people who don't work on it. Uh, other projects, your friends, your family, and like if you can do it, find gamers with disabilities to play your title. It makes a huge difference. Uh, the other thing is a lot of these changes that were massively beneficial to gamers with disabilities weren't actually originally proposed for an accessibility reason. They just had a huge benefit uh, that we capitalized on. So most of our accessibility features were in this category. And we didn't implement a single accessibility feature that hurt our core audience. It made it better for everyone every time. 
And uh, lastly, our accessibility efforts wouldn't have been nearly as successful um, if we hadn't told people about them in the community. So really the best part for us was the community response. We basically made our own little army of accessibility advocates. They were helping each other find uh, you know, features they needed, they would tag devs in the forums and say, oh, so-and-so was talking about this, I think it's accessibility related, can you help them? And a group of Evolve fans even pulled together enough money to help sponsor this conference. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, Shara is the collective name of me and Shane, uh, and we used to basically be it, uh, idiots on the internet, I guess is the best way to call it. <laughs> and uh, we get all of the, these are just with the exception of this mommy one, that's my actual mom, these are all just people on Twitter who donated money to get Shara as an official sponsor of the conference. So that was really cool for us, that these, these are not gamers with impairments, these are just gamers uh, who, who raised money to sponsor the conference. So by doing accessibility stuff, you too can create your own little army of accessibility advocates. Um, so one thing that, this is like a terrible URL, uh, but if you go to this URL, um, you can, <laughs> I know, <laughs> this URL is terrible, go to it. Uh, no, so uh, the report card that I mentioned early, uh, earlier, we actually put it up, um, and you can go there, you can use it yourself, uh, you know, evaluate your own game, um, and that's really it. Uh, I don't have any time for questions, so sorry about that, but uh, with that, uh, my talk's over. You can take a screenshot, again, of the ridiculous URL. I will tweet it out later. And uh, I think it's time for uh, another break, so uh, we'll see you guys in a half hour.